What if you could build a Commodore 64 entirely from scratch? I mean, no 6502 CPU, no VIC-2 chip, no SID chip, and no programmable array logic. Just good old logic chips, static RAM, and EEPROMs. Oh, and some fundamentals of computer science. In this series, we're rebuilding a Commodore 64 from the ground up without these original chips. And, by the end, it'll run real Commodore 64 games. If you've ever wondered how a computer really works, this is the perfect way to learn. Let's get started. The Commodore 64 uses the 6510 microprocessor, which is based on the famous 6502. I will make the difference clear in video 3 of this series, but for now, I'll use the term 6510 and 6502 interchangeably. I'm going to build this Commodore 64 as a trilogy of trilogies. Hmm, where do I get that idea from? In Epic 1, we'll have the CPU build, which is this video. Then we'll work on text-based display, and the bring up is a simple Commodore 64 that would run basic. Epic 2 will basically be about sprites. Simple sprites, multiple complex sprites, then the sprite sprite and sprite text interactions with interrupts. Epic 3 will be about sound. First, a single voice, then the more complex SID chip operations, and finally system integration. So it should be a fun series, especially for those of you who've watched the VIC-20 series. We'll get to see the similarities and differences between the machines and how the team at Commodore and MOS Technologies really expanded the architecture. Before we jump into building the Commodore 64 CPU, let's have a look at the architecture of the 6502 CPU. If we break it down, we see the key components that define a von Neumann architecture, the accumulator, the program counter, the instruction register, the ALU, and the sequencer. These aren't unique to the 6502. These ideas go back to the earliest digital computers. One of the first computers with random access memory was the Manchester Mark I, which was designed by Frederick Williams, Tom Kilburn, and Jeff Toodle. But Alan Turing worked on the software side. It was one of the first operational stored program computers, designed along the principles described by John von Neumann in his famous first draft paper. It used cathode ray tubes for both main memory and for storing the contents of the various registers. Here, tube C is for the program counter and instruction register. A is the accumulator, and B contains the index registers. M's for multiplication. What's really missing compared to a 6502 CPU is the stack pointer but the idea of a stack wasn't really formalised until the 1950s. With everything laid out like this, it's easy to see why people think the 6502 is about as simple as a functional CPU can get. But there's actually an even simpler model, the Turing machine. Now, you might be thinking, Turing published his paper in 1936. They're extremely simple in their design. And Turing was involved in the Manchester Mark I project, so why did they just build a simple Turing machine? Without random access memory, a Turing machine is very slow. And when I say slow, I really mean it. This is pure Turing playing Apple Pac-Man. Yes, it's actually running. Even with a 300-fold speed boost, it's still painfully slow. That's because every single memory access has to be done sequentially. There's no random access at all. Now, imagine trying to run a real program like this using vacuum tubes. It just wasn't practical. Skipping ahead to today, from a learning perspective, the simplicity of the Turing machine actually makes it a powerful tool. A random access Turing machine is fast enough to emulate these 8-bit CPUs in real time, and storing a few megabytes in a lookup table is trivial with modern hardware. The Turing machine is an abstraction of computing because it assumes infinite memory, and honestly, the original paper isn't the easiest read. But at its core, a Turing machine just has two things, a rule book and a notepad. For example, the notepad works just like the one we use during long addition. And the rule book? It's just the addition table printed on the back of a child's notepad. That's it. With just a rule book and a notepad, we can compute anything that's computable. That includes the instruction set that runs the 6502 microprocessor. Because, at its core, a CPU is just a more optimised version of this same fundamental idea. So far, we've been talking about rule books in an abstract way. But what if we want to build one physically? What I'm going to do is store all the rules I want to use in a computer memory. You can think of a computer's memory as a set of pigeonholes, each holding a coloured duck. 
Each pigeonhole has a unique number, and in computer science, we usually start counting from zero. The information we store is simply the colour of the duck in any given pigeonhole. This chip's an EEPROM, a type of memory. We can only look up one piece of information at a time. If we provide a pigeonhole number written in binary on the address lines, the EEPROM outputs the corresponding duck colour, also in binary on the data lines. In normal operating mode, we can only read pre-stored data from an EEPROM. It's pretty straightforward. We provide the address of the memory cell we're interested in as a binary number on the address lines. Then, a short time later, the information stored at that location is presented on the data lines by the EEPROM. That's pretty much it. Change the address, and the data lines are updated with the information stored at this new address. EEPROM stands for Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memory. It can store information permanently, but unlike regular RAM, the data remains even when the power is off. To erase the EEPROM, we use a UV light eraser, and to program it, we need a special tool connected to the computer. But in normal operation, the stored information can't be changed. It's fixed, just like the rules in our rulebook. We can use the EEPROMs to store the information, but once we have looked up a rule, we need to store the result temporarily because it tells us which rule to use next. To do that, we use an octal D type flip flop. You can think of it as a single memory cell that holds a value until we decide to update it. This particular chip, the 74HC574, has 8 input wires, 8 output wires, and 1 clock input. Here's how it works. When the clock input's high, it doesn't matter what's on the inputs, the stored value doesn't change. When clock's low, Again, the stored value doesn't change. So, what gives? How does it actually store a value? The key is what happens at the exact moment when the clock transitions from low to high. Whatever data is on the inputs at that instant gets captured, stored inside the flip-flops, and then presented on the outputs. To implement a Turing machine that can emulate the 6510 CPU inside a Commodore 64, I'm going to use two rather large EEPROMs. Each arranged as 2 meg by 16 bits. I'll wire them in parallel, giving us a 32-bit output, and we'll capture the output using four octal D-type flip-flops. To keep things simple, I'll just represent the EEPROM as one solid block in this diagram. Now here's the trick. 12 of the outputs from the flip-flops feed back to the address lines of the EEPROM. These 12 bits represent the state, and this forms a structure called a finite state machine. A finite state machine can have an input, which I've made 8 bits here, and an output, which is also 8 bits. When I program the EEPROM, I create a lookup table that maps every possible 8-bit input character to every possible 12-bit state. The output consists of three parts. 8 bits of data output, 12 bits of next state, but this means we have 12 bits left over. I'm going to call these leftover signals the control output, because these signals are used to control various modules attached to the finite state machine. So how do we use this structure to perform addition like we saw earlier? Let's say I present the number 4 as the first input. This gets stored in our next state register. Now I present 5 on the input lines. The EEPROM lookup table sees both numbers 4 and 5 and outputs 9. It doesn't compute this using a conventional adder. Instead, it's just looking up the answer from a pre-computed table of all possible sums. But this raises another question. Where do the 4 and 5 come from, and where does the 9 go once we're done? Well, this is why we need the notepad. Just like our long addition example, the 4 and 5 are read from the notepad, and the 9 is written back to the notepad just as a human would do when solving a math problem. Now, let's take a look at the notepad. The heart of the notepad that I'm building for our Turing machine is just a static RAM, another type of computer memory. In ordinary use, the static RAM has two modes of operation, read and write. In read mode, the static RAM behaves almost exactly like an EEPROM. We present an address written in binary on the address lines, and the memory outputs the stored data, again in binary on the data lines. So far, so good, but here's where things get interesting. Unlike the EEPROM, the static RAM allows us to write new data during normal operation. When the write enable pins low, the memory enters write mode. We present an address on the address lines, but this time, we also place new data on the data lines. 
Instead of just reading from a memory location, the static RAM overwrites the existing data with whatever it sees on the data lines. Once written, the old data is lost. It's permanently replaced by the new value. In summary, the key difference between the static RAM and the EEPROM is this. EEPROM, data is fixed after programming. We can only read from it in normal operation. Static RAM, we can read and write freely, but it loses its contents when powered off. This ability to update memory on the fly is critical because it means our Turing machine can modify what's stored in the notepad as it computes. So far, we have a rule book, which is a finite state machine based on an EEPROM, and the notepad, which is a static RAM. But how do we actually connect them together? The simplest way is just to use some of our remaining outputs from the D-type flip-flops to drive the static RAM address lines. We can also create a data bus shared by the static RAM data lines, finite state machine output, and the finite state machine input. At the start of the clock cycle after the falling edge of clock, we read from the static RAM, and then this data goes into the EEPROM. Then, on the rising edge of clock, the finite state machine's new state is latched into the flip-flops. In the second half of the cycle, when clock's high, the finite state machine flip-flops are enabled, which drive the data bus. The static RAM is set to write mode, and data flows from the finite state output to the static RAM input, and this writes the updated value. But this setup has a problem. The SRAM address is updated on the rising edge of clock and held until the next rising edge. This means we would write data to a location when clock's high, then when clock goes low, we'd read back from the same location. That's not very useful. What we actually want is to read data from any given address, feed this data into the rule book, update the finite state machine and output, then write the result back to the same static RAM address. We can fix this by adding in another set of flip-flops on the address lines, but these flip-flops are clocked on the negative edge of the clock cycle. Now, the address used during the read cycle is stable and remains the same for the write cycle. Far more useful. But, even with all of this working, this still isn't a full computer. According to Turing's definition, the rule book shouldn't need to know where we are on the notepad. The same rule should apply whether we're working on the ones column or the 100,000 column. Turing's original solution was a tape that could move back and forth allowing us to process data without caring about its absolute position. The modern solid-state equivalent is to add an up-down counter to the static RAM address lines. This would technically give us a Turing machine, but it would be incredibly slow, because we'd only access the memory one step at a time, sequentially. And that brings us to the final piece we need to make a practical Turing machine, random access. One way we can add random access without the rulebook needing to know the absolute location of the data is by using indirect addressing. What does this mean? Using an index into an array is a simple form of index addressing. In this case, I determines the exact address of the data we're interested in. Let's start with our original static RAM, which I'm going to call the register store RAM. This is where we keep temporary values such as 6502 register values and certain addresses. Now, we add a second RAM chip, which I'll call the main memory RAM. This is where our actual 6502 program and data will be stored. Its data lines are connected to the same data bus as the register store RAM and the finite state machine. Next, we introduce two octal D-type flip-flops. Their inputs are connected to the data bus, and their outputs form a 16-bit address, which feed into the address lines of the main memory RAM. These flip-flops are called memory address registers. They hold the address of the memory location we want to access. Now, let's say we need to fetch the next 6502 instruction. We store its 16-bit address inside the register store S RAM as two bytes. Using the register mirroring technique, when values are stored at certain locations in the register store RAM, they're automatically copied into the memory address registers. Instead of directly accessing the register store RAM, we now use the address stored in the MART to read from the main memory RAM, retrieving the instruction that we want to execute. The rulebook doesn't need to know where in main memory the instruction came from. That's stored in the register store RAM. It only needs to know what to do with this instruction. If, after fetching our instruction, our finite state machine increments the 16-bit value stored in the register store RAM, then this stored value is effectively acting like our program counter, 
And just like that, we've built a system that can execute a sequence of instructions without the rulebook needing to track absolute memory locations. These two memories together form our notepad. One for storing registers and temporary values, and the other holding our main program and data. With this configuration, we now have a system that's Turing complete, or at least as Turing complete as the 6502 with 64K of main memory attached is. Using a random access Turing machine will probably be very novel to many of you, but there are three levels to understanding this CPU. We have the basic Turing machine using the rulebook and notepad analogy. Then we expand the design to allow random access into the main memory. Level 2 is about understanding the code in the EEPROM of the rulebook. This determines whether we're emulating a 6502, a Z80, or some other microprocessor. In level 3, we add extra functional units an ALU module to reduce the size of the rulebook, and a program counter to reduce the number of clocks per instruction. At this point, you might be wondering how exactly do we generate the rules in the rulebook that allow us to emulate the 6502 instruction set. Well, I've got some good news and some bad news. The bad news is, that's a four-hour discussion. The good news is that I've already covered it in detail in the Turing 6502 playlist on this channel. In that series, I walk through the fetch, decode, and execute cycle, as well as jumps and branches. We go step by step through the 6502 addressing modes, immediate, absolute, zero-paged, indexed, and even the tricky ones like X indexed indirect and indirect Y indexed. After that, we cover logical operations, arithmetic operations, and stack operations. Everything needed to make a full 6502 emulator work inside this system. I'm going to build our random access Turing machine on printed circuit boards, so I need to create a schematic diagram. First I lay down the 227C322E proms. I'm going to use the ZIF or Zero Insertion Force footprint for this, because I'm going to need to flip in and out lots of EEPROMs during development. Next I lay down the four Octal D-type flip-flops. On printed circuit boards I tend to use the 74HC374, but when I'm doing point-to-point -point wiring, I prefer the 74HC574. Next, we connect up these Octal D-type flip-flops to the EEPROMs and form our finite state machine. We can see here where I'm going to physically lay down these chips on the printed circuit board. Next, we design the register store notepad static RAM. This is pretty simple. We pass the address from the finite state machine to an Octal D-type flip-flop, which delays the address by half a clock as we've discussed before. We also need to delay the memory write, MAR high clock and MAR low clock signals for the same reason. After that, we add the main memory static RAM and the MAR high and MAR low octal flip flops. These lay down compactly on the printed circuit board in the bottom left corner. Finally, I have another octal D type flip flop and an octal latch connecting the W bus back to the address lines of the EEPROM. I'll go over this in more detail later. But for now, the upper latch will be in pass-through mode, and I'll leave the bottom flip-flops disabled for now. So at the moment, this doesn't really do much. But I think this will help speed up the design and reduce the size of the rulebook later on. We'll get to that later in the series. Here they are in the upper corner of the printed circuit board. I'm going to use the free routing software to do the manual routing. This really simplifies the build. This has the KiCad prediction for the board. And here's what it actually looks like. Only one mistake. I connected A22 to one of the OR gates instead of A23. But does it work? Here's the board being clocked by an Arduino, so it's running at about a tenth or a twentieth of real time. But it does run Apple II Pac-Man, which is my go-to test for the 6502 rulebook code. Now, we still need to make a few modifications to make this a 6510 that can boot the Commodore Basic ROM. Are we getting there? In the next video, we'll look at the raster generator for getting the display going. Again, using just EEPROMs, static RAM, and TTL logic. That's it for this video. But if you haven't already, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.